blessed Thursday morning, June 17th. We give thanks to God for this new day, for the bird singing, for the sunshine, for the mountain, all the stuff that God has given us today. And we gather in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. You have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Praise to the blessed and holy Trinity, one God who gives us life, salvation, and resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship and praise. Be still and know that I am God. We're continuing with our Grateful by Diana Butler Bass. And today it's a, a debt-free world section of Circles of Gratitude. We're going to look a little bit into the, the Lord's Prayer. So I'm going to dive in here. If gifts precede benefactors, there is no expectation to return the favor because givers are simply passing on a gift and other gifts will come their way. Receivers are freed from the debts of gratitude and may graciously pass whatever gifts they can, can onto others instead of paying back the benefactor. Jesus taught this clearly. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to gain, to receive as much again, but love your enemies, do good and lend expecting nothing in return. Luke 6, 34 to 35. The free movement of gifts in a non-hierarchical way is the very heart of Christianity. According to Leinhardt, Lightheart, givers impose no debt and the only debt of receivers is to love others. He refers to this as the infinite circle of gratitude and contrasts it to the closed system of obligation that bound people to opposite forms of patronage and payback. Gratitude is not about manners and courtesy. It is never truly private. Is it, about, it is about the nature of society. It is deeply and profoundly political and opens us up to revolutionary idea of a debt-free community that shares in the mutual benefit of creation's gifts. Yeah. Nature's gifts while unmasking privilege and permanently undoing all forms of slavery. We must move away from debt and duty con constructs towards a vision of gratitude as gift and response. If that sounds too political, a discussion with little place in a book on either gratitude or spirituality, consider for a moment that this idea appears to be one of the most significant of all the New Testament's teaching, the Lord's Prayer. I grew up with a Methodist church. Every Sunday we recited the prayer that Jesus shared with his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As a child, I liked those comforting words, especially that mystery sounding one trespasses. I had no idea what a trespass was, but it seemed important that Jesus would insist that we, they be forgiven, whether we did, we did them or if someone did them to us. It would not be until I was 13 in confirmation class that a Methodist pastor finally told me what a trespass was, is a poetic word for sin. The, word, the Lord's Prayer asks that our sins be forgiven and that we might forgive anyone who sinned against us. Aha, that made sense. A decade or so later, I visited a Presbyterian church for the first time. The Lord's Prayer was included in the service and I mouthed the familiar words, give us today our daily bread and forgive us our, I almost said trespasses, but the Bolton said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What debts? The Lord's Prayer is about money? This made absolutely no sense to me. I miss those lyrical trespasses, trespasses or debts. What is going on here? The New Testament is written in Greek. Hamertia is a Greek word for sin. It, it means to miss the mark 
to err or to be fa fatally flawed. That is how we use, we usually think about sin. It is about failing to get, make good so choices and or doing something naughty, perhaps because of some sort of deep character flaw. But Jesus didn't speak Greek, he spoke Aramaic, the local language in the ancient Middle East related to Hebrew. The word I learned as trespasses was most likely the Aramaic word kova, which is a translation of the word that is the source of an important distinction. There are two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament, one in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 11, and the other in Matthew, Matthew 6. Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer uses harmatia to translate koba, but Matthew's version does not. Matthew chooses a different word, ophela he mata, which means debts. He does, go, he does go for a very particular reason. Most ra rabbis in Jesus' time, and Jesus was a rabbi, understood sin as debt with a connotation of weight, burdens, and obligations. Jewish theology taught that human beings owe only one debt, and it is not a burden, but a joy. We owe God faithfulness and praise because God alone is the giver of all gifts, the daily bread of the Lord's prayer. False debts enslave us to idols if there is no giver but God. In Matthew's gospel, the Lord's prayer immediately follows the Beatitudes. Jesus' sermon proclaims blessing upon outcasts and the oppressed and then moves to freedom from debt. The prayer literally reads, forsake our debts as we forsake our debtors. These are canceled debts. Jesus teaches his followers to leave behind the whole system of indebtedness and obligates people to, that obligates people to seizure, Caesar. Essentially, the Lord's Prayer is a takedown of the Roman economics and politics. The prayer describes an economy of abundance that begins in heaven, where there is always enough, where, the, where all are blessed. Heaven is a vision of what is the world is to be, a community that entrusts God's provision and holds no one in debt. Sin is... Let's see, I'm almost done here. Sin is when the circle of abundance is abused and when we see gifts as something we have earned, own, and can take, make others earn. And we set up a system of indebtedness whereby we enrich ourselves and control others. In the Bible, sin is debt and debt is sin. The Lord's Prayer is comforting. We can live free from the naughty things we do or the naughty things done to us, but it is not only about some spiritualized idea of sin about our flaws and misdeeds. This radical prayer undermines imperial economics. The entire ancient Roman world was structured on debt, a political system in which debts are discharged by tributes, loyalty, and utter obedience to Caesar. And the whole world is, was indebted to Caesar and the whole earth was his by right, everyone and everything he owned. Jesus says, no, he says, he prays, free us from debt, from holding others in debt, and from our anger against those who hold us in debt. Release us from the entanglements of debt slavery. Free us from Caesar's yoke. We long to live only to the gratitude of God as the heart of Jesus' prayer is, is politics, the structure of our world, right? In prayer, Jesus restates one of the most ignored directives in the Hebrew Bible. Every seventh year, you should grant a remission of debts. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against the neighbor, not exacting it on the neighbor who is a member of the community because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed, Deuteronomy 15. Every seven years, all debts were to be canceled, all debts. And it, to really whoop it up, every 49 years, all land is to be returned to its original owners. No one was to work the land for an entire year. People were to simply live the land's natural abundance, Levit Leviticus 25. The Bible calls us to Sabbath and depicts a world without work, a world free of debt. Imagine how grateful we would be, a jubilee of gratitude. So this is one of the things about the Lord's Prayer that I think is fascinating, that Luke and Matthew do use some different words for key parts of that prayer and part of it fits in their their view of it is it debt sin as debt sin as um on our conscience um is more the the luke version so looking at those two things um they're both it's a both end it's not a choose between it must be debt or it must be what the sin on the burden on our conscience and things like that um but it opens up a little bit of of what do you think of debt? And truly, I mean, I've done that study too. The, the Matthew one and Matthew talks about debt. Um, 
and through the Bible as they talk about the jubilee years or the the years where you forgive the debt of others. I mean, I'm still paying for my college loans, so I would love that one to come of like oh, my college loans are gone. I have like 10 years left of like the 30 year process, but it'll get there. I mean, some, not all debt's bad. Um, so thinking about that, thinking about if we every, how many years was it? Every seventh year a remission of debt, what would that do? And maybe we would make debts differently as well if you knew that in seven years they would be canceled out. Um, I don't think we'd be putting 30 year mortgages knowing that at year seven years in they would be canceled. We would structure things differently. Once again, this is about structure. Why do we have the structure we have? What does it help? What does it hurt? And not just the, the house debt or canceling debts, but the debts that you have to one another. Um, the quid pro quo, the system, and instead of that, the a freedom of that, a recognition that we all receive our daily bread and we're passing on a gift from God to somebody else. Um, maybe there's a debt of our work, but even the ability to work is a gift from God. A reorienting of, of ownership, including of our own actions and our, the fruit of our labors um, are something to gift. And, and we, have, we have a system that receiving the compensation for those. Um, where is it helpful and where is it potentially something that limits us? So thinking about sin as debt and how that fits into this freeing, uh, naming the political system, that's part of what Matthew is. Matthew really looks back at that and in the connection with uh, the Old Testament, but also the a lot with the authorities of the time. Matthew focuses a lot on that. Um, so he would be very conscious of, of where the Christians or the those who the disciples are in the reality of the world and where Caesar is and how that impacts faith and life and where we are in bondage. So with Christ freeing us from bondage and forgiveness, that is part of what he does. The also the other part of freedom from bondage that Christ has come to do when you think of forgiveness as a central part of the gospel, um, what we should do and do not do, um, what we do and harm, what is done to us and and holds us captive um, and to be freed from those things, that is also forgiveness. So debt is part, and I think we, it is important, like Matthew does, to hold up that part of forgiveness, that part of debted, indebtedness and how it enslaves us potentially or causes us to be enslavers. And then the other piece of what holds your conscience? What, what, what holds your identity um, captive? What holds your life captive? I mean, sin, death, and the devil and how Christ has come to forgive and to free you from that cycle as well. So it does fit into the gratitude of, of um, all that God has done and to recognize by using just a simply a different word in the original text, how much we, we miss. And we can talk about too, you know, as we, you know, sin, trespass, death, and how um, we need to define those terms too in, in our community and to pull out the richness and the fullness of forgiveness because of different words we can use to embody how expansive Christ's forgiveness is for us and be grateful for that. Be still and know that I am God. You have been born anew through the living and abiding word of God. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. We thank you that you forgive us our sins. Um, those that we have committed, those that we hold on our conscience, those that um, sweeten our ear to um, doubt your, your word. So we give thanks that you put your word in our ears and give us faith. And we also give thanks of the, the thought of debt 
um, the transactional relationships that you also free up and allow to become more than just what we owe each other, but um, how to free us into other dimensions of relationship and life. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness, we pray. We pray for those who are mourning. We pray for those who are fearful. We pray for those who are in need. You know who they are, Lord, and we lift them to you now. Those who are hospitalized, those who are in the search of work, those who are in the midst of addiction and other need, we ask for your provision and we ask for your um, life for those um, in these circumstances all of us in some ways at some time for the gifts of relationship with others we rejoice and we give thanks and we ask for you to help us in our relationships to forgive to to allow space to grow and to change, to, to speak up when somebody is faltering, when it's appropriate. Guide us into those discerning moments and um, forgive us when we fall short so that those relationships can, can flourish and grow as they need and as can be. For the communion of faith in your church, we give thanks. We give thanks for last night at church with some singing outside, um, beautiful evening, some laughter and um, community. It's a foretaste of the feast to come, Lord, and give thanks for the opportunities that will be in the coming months for us to have that community of faith once again in, in person, not just virtually. Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world. We pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for gridlock. <laughs> we pray for different ways of doing things, that you find a way forward for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we ask for, for hopefulness and for peace for, for now and for the future. So help us, Lord, as we are weary and as we are in need, as every generation is. But we ask in this time and in these circumstances that your light be sh um, shine in the midst of murky times in some ways, but yet in a time also where there's hope um, for what is to come. For the people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare or the pandemic, we pray. We pray that we don't just live in the shadow of life and that people around the world don't just see the reflection of what life could be, but that they have abundant life, that we have abundant life. And so whether it's strife or warfare or pestilence or plague, <laughs> we ask for reprieve and abundance to take their place. For all who work for peace and international harmony, we ask that you call more people into that work. For all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, thank you for calling us to be stewards from the very beginning of creation. The first thing you really asked of us and something we still struggle with doing, Lord, May we continue to struggle, but struggle with purpose and with the care of this planet that we call home in mind. For the church of Jesus Christ in every land, sustain us, support us, guide us forward. Oh God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us this day. Amen.